Well, good afternoon. I am very happy to be here. I'm very happy to have you um, to join me um, in this conversation um, this afternoon about um, Dr. King, um, Dr. Reddick, Montgomery, um, and many, many um, other things. This uh, project has been a, uh, a pet project of mine. Um, I knew of Dr. Reddick's work um, for some time, and when I first came to um, or arrived at Alabama State, I was struck by the number of my students who were not aware that the first biography of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was literally written on our campus. Um, and they were also not aware of who Dr. L.D. Reddick um, was. Um, um, Tom Brokaw often talks about the um, men who fought in World War II as the greatest generation. Um, I think about the men and women who, um, you know, who blazed the trails um, um, for um, civil and human um, rights um, in this country. And, you know, I'm pretty awestruck um, by these individuals. And, and so um, I, I think they were pretty um, great um, also. Um, Dr. Reddick was um, uh, an amazing um, individual, uh, an amazing um, intellect. Um, he um, was the second um, curator of the County Cullum branch of the New York Public Library, um, um, which is now known as the Schomburg Center for uh, the Study of um, uh, Black Culture. Um, it's located in Harlem. Um, and um, he um, succeeded uh, Arturo um, Schomburg. Um, the namesake um, for um, that, that particular library. Um, and from there, he went to Atlanta University, uh, where he became um, a professor of history as well as the um, chief librarian for Atlanta University. Atlanta University is now defunct. Um, it's, it's, it's no more, but um, in its heyday, um, it was the black version of the University of Chicago, by which I mean it was primarily a graduate school. Um, and W.E.B. Du Bois at one time headed the sociology department um, at um, Atlanta University. And the studies that um, Dr. Du Bois and his graduate students produced are, are still seminal um, studies um, today. Um, um, I'm thinking right now about the study that they did on blacks in Farmville, uh, Virginia. Uh, Farmville, Virginia, of course, is the birthplace of Robert Russo Moton, um, the successor of Booker T. Washington. Um, you know, I joke, I tell people that whenever I'm in Tuskegee, I always claim him as a relative. <laughs> it's amazing what doors open when I do that. <laughs> but um, um, they also uh, produced a study called Negro Crime in Georgia. Um, and that, that particular study I used uh, for my doctoral um, dissertation. And one of my committee members said to me, where do you find this stuff? I'm thinking right in the library, you know? So, um, um, yeah, so uh, Atlanta University was a, a very um, um, important um, school. Um, it has now merged with Clark College. Um, and so now it's Clark um, um, Atlanta uh, uh, University. Um, Atlanta University had one, the oldest um, graduate program in library science. Um, uh, for a very long time, um, the dean of that school was Virginia Lacey Jones. Um, and any li black librarian of a certain age um, more than likely graduated from Atlanta University and more than likely knew uh, um, Dr. Jones or Dean Jones. Um, I met uh, my wife, who is sitting in the audience, um, at Atlanta University. She was in library school there. Um, I had just started the library program there. 
Um, and so we both knew um, Dr. Jones. She had retired um, by the time that I had arrived at the school, but she was still quite visible um, on, um, on, on campus. Um, we knew um, um, Julian Bond's mother, um, Julia um, um, Bond. Um, she was a librarian um, at the Atlanta University um, Center and um, befriended a number of students. And, and so I, I have very fond memories of, of her. Um, but Dr. Reddick was the librarian for the um, Trevor Arnett Library. Um, the Trevor Arnett Library serviced um, all the schools um, in the a, um, AU Center or the Atlanta University Center. Those um, schools would have included ITC, um, Morehouse um, College, um, Spelman College, um, Clark College, then Atlanta University, and um, Morris Brown um, College, um, which um, I understand is on the rebound. Um, so. Uh, Dr. Reddick was a, a, pr a pretty um, um, important um, um, intellect. Um, he um, was he piled around with with the likes of of people like Lorenzo Green, um, Rayford Logan, E. Franklin Frazier, W. E. B. Du Bois, um, Horace Mann Bond. I mean, these were not just casual acquaintances of Dr. Reddick. Um, these were personal and professional friends of, of his. Um, as a matter of fact, if you go to the website for the Association for the Study of African American um, 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 History and Culture, um, um, or the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, um, the organization that Carter G. Woodson um, founded. Um, you will see Dr. Reddick's name on that homepage. Um, he's referred to as one of Dr. Woodson's boys, and that's not a um, disparagement. Um, uh, it's really a term of endearment. And so um, he and the other gentleman that I just named um, were part of a group of intellectuals that assisted um, um, Dr. Um, Carter G. Woodson. Um, so a little bit about the um, first biography of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Crusader Without Violence. There are only two biographies of Dr. King that were written while he was alive. This is the first one, um, that is Crusader Without Violence. The other is What Manner of Man, and that was written by a Morehouse classmate of Dr. King's, and that was Lerone Bennett Jr. Lerone Bennett Jr. died last February. Uh, um, he died on Valentine's Day. Um, but he had been long associated with Johnson Publications in Chicago. Um, and a prolific author, um, noted speaker, um, and and so those are the only two biographies of Dr. King that were written while he was alive. This biography, that is Crusader Without Violence, is the only biography that was written with Dr. King's assistance. Um, that Dr. Reddick and um, Dr. King and Mrs. King collaborated um, in the writing of this book. He shared every single page uh, with them. Um, and so they read everything, um, and and so um, that's another unique aspect about um, this book. Um, this is the only, or Dr. Reddick is the only biographer of Dr. King that was an eyewitness to the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, um, Dr. King arrived, or Dr. and Mrs. King arrived in Montgomery in 1954. Um, Dr. Reddick arrived in Montgomery in 1955. Um, and um, it was just fate um, that Dr. Reddick would, would find himself um, in Montgomery. Um, I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that he was a, a good friend of Horseman Bond. Um, by the way, um, um, Dr. Bond 
um, is the uh, first black president of Lincoln um, University in Pennsylvania, the oldest historically black school. Um, he's also the father of Julian Bond, um, someone whom I knew and, and, and really um, um, whose friendship I cherished. Um, so um, Dr. Harper Council Trenum, who is also a, a Morehouse graduate, and actually did graduate work at the University of Chicago where Dr. Um, Reddick received his PhD in history in 1939, was also a dear friend of Dr. Horseman Bond. And so it was through that um, sort of uh, um, triangle that um, um, Dr. Reddick would find himself um, um, in, in Montgomery. Um, so I'm going to uh, I have uh, a PowerPoint, but uh, it's mostly of some primary documents that I want to share with you, and I will um, discuss um, um, those documents as, um, as we uh, sort of um, tick through them. This was an um, article in the Afro-American uh, newspaper. Um, dated June 25th, 1916, uh, excuse me, 1960. This was, uh, uh, this was shortly after Dr. Reddick was terminated at Alabama State University. He was terminated at Alabama State University on June the 14th, um, 1960. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because I think he encapsulates what the, uh, the, what the circumstances that he faced um, here um, in Alabama in the wake of the publication of Crusader Without Violence as well as the first sit-in demonstration to take place in Alabama which was orchestrated by students at Alabama State College. And so you can see where um, he said that the state had been fighting um, Dr. King and the movement desperately, um, that the governor knew that he had accompanied Dr. King to India. Um, Dr. Reddick also accompanied um, Dr. King to Africa, um, uh, to Ghana. Uh, uh, he testified um, uh, for Dr. King at his um, 1956 trial. You recall there were 90 boycott leaders that were um, uh, that were indicted uh, for violating the anti-boycott law in Alabama, and a lot of people like to think that this anti-boycott law was a law that was created for the bus boycott. It was not. It was an anti-labor law, um, and it was a law to prevent uh, or to preclude. Um, strikers from um, vote, uh, excuse me, from boycotting um, their place of um, employment. Um, and I also like this part where he said the governor had been mad um, at the faculty of Alabama State College ever since the students there began an anti-Jim Crow campaign last February. Um, and I would suggest that the governor and the governor, in this case, is Governor John Patterson, that the governor had been sore probably since 1955 uh, with the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, recall that John Patterson was the person who outlawed the NAACP um, in the state of Alabama. It was also John Patterson who was a party to the landmark um, libel case um, Sullivan versus New York Times. Um, and so, um, um, Attorney General Patterson, then um, Governor uh, Patterson, was a formidable um, opponent uh, for uh, Dr. King and others. And my belief, um, and this is just based on what I have studied, the documents that I have studied, is that it was because of Governor Patterson that um, the King family left Montgomery in 1960. Um, that they had been harassed and harangued um, every day 
since they, their arrival, uh, or I should say since the, the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott. And Dr. King and I believe Mrs. King had just had enough. Now, of course, um, um, Daddy King, um, Martin Luther King Sr. was elated because he wanted um, them to leave a year you know, earlier. Uh, but uh, I, I really do think that um, because of the type of scrutiny, pressure, and um, as I said, harassing or harassment that they were under, um, that they um, left um, the state of Alabama. I just recently learned, um, and you are probably familiar with this um, uh, case, um, Dr. King participated in a sit-in demonstration in Atlanta at a department store, Ridge's department store. Um, he was arrested with 21 other students. Um, his arrest violated um, an earlier parole that he had in DeKalb County. Uh, because of that parole violation, Dr. King was sentenced to four months hard labor at Reesville State Prison. Uh, Mrs. King was terrified, and so was the, uh, the rest of the King family of what possibly could happen um, to Dr. King um, in Reedsville State Prison. She reached out to then Vice President Richard Nixon and asked if he could um, intervene. Uh, and Nixon did not. Uh, and then the King family reached out to uh, Robert and John F. Kennedy. Uh, of course, um, John F. Kennedy was running for president uh, Robert Kennedy um, uh, called some people that he knew, and um, the Kennedy brothers were able to have, uh, or were instrumental in having um, Dr. King uh, released um, from prison. Uh, Daddy King was so elated um, that he announced from the pulpit at Ebenezer Baptist Church that he was changing his party affiliation from Republican to Democrat and voted for John F. Kennedy for President of the United States. And they say, or historians have written, that on, based on that very announcement by Daddy King, that scores of African Americans who previously had voted Republican um, and my students don't know that most African Americans voted Republican um, up until the Kennedy election um, because the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln and because of the Emancipation Proclamation. And, and so that so the defection probably did not culminate until the election of, of William Jefferson Clinton. Um, but um, Daddy King announced that um, he was going to vote for um, John Kennedy. Dr. King and Mrs. King had not lived in Atlanta long enough, or Georgia, excuse me, long enough to establish residency. And so they uh, applied for um, an absentee ballot from Alabama uh, so that they could both vote in the um, November 1960 uh, presidential election. Alabama refused um, to give um, um, Dr. King an absentee ballot because he had not paid his 1958 and his 1959 poll taxes. And so uh, what I believe, um, and I haven't found anything to contradict this, is that Dr. King was unable to vote in the November 1960 election, was unable to vote for the man um, who was responsible for his release from Reesville um, prison. Um, in Georgia. Um, and as I said, I just recently um, discovered this maybe two, three weeks ago. Um, so um, Alabama was, was, um, was a very special place for um, Dr. and um, um, Coretta um, Scott King. Um, um, Mrs. King grew up in Marion, um, Alabama, in Perry County. She is a um, graduate of Lincoln High School. Um, that is the birthplace of Alabama State University. And what I'd like to say is that we knew Mrs. King before Dr. King knew Mrs. <laughs> King. 
<laughs> and so Jane Young, um, Andrew Young's first wife, also um, grew up in Marion, and she also is a graduate of Lincoln High School. And so likewise, we knew um, Jane, um, I forget her family name, uh, but we knew her before Andrew Young, Ambassador Young, um, um, knew her. Um, so, and, and Mrs. King's uh, father um, actually um, was fairly well-to-do and uh, used one of his trucks or allowed one of his trucks to be used as the uh, quasi-school bus uh, for the, uh, the Lincoln School. And so I, I, I love telling that story because this place, um, this state, um, was very special to the Kings. I mean, they named their first son Dexter um, because of Dr. King's um, pastorate at um, Dexter Avenue um, um, Baptist Church. Um, here is a, um, an, an announcement um, that I, Dr. Reddick or someone um, at the university uh, um, uh, wrote uh, um, announcing the publication of um, Crusader Without Violence. Um, Dr. King um, had published, or I should say, had written and um, 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 uh, had written Stride Toward Freedom, the Montgomery story, the year uh, before in 1958. Um, Dr. Reddick um, assisted in the writing of that book. Um, um, a, a number of those chapters were ghostwritten uh, by um, Dr. Reddick. Here's a letter um, to Dr. Reddick from Dr. Du Bois. Um, um, <laughs> And, you know, uh, Dr. Du Bois, I'm waiting to hear from you um, in your new position. Um, uh, please uh, criticize the enclosed. Of course, I will not mention your name in case of publication. Um, a lot of people tapped Dr. Reddick's um, brain or intellect. Um, this here is a letter from Dr. Horseman Bond. I would like to draw your attention to the second paragraph where Dr. Bond writes, I was unable to send you a Christmas gift commensurate with the great pains you took in helping me to get the thesis finished and accepted. Well, the thesis that Dr. Bond is referring to was his University of Chicago thesis. Um, that um, PhD dissertation which he subsequently turned into a book, is the seminal history of Negro education um, in Alabama. Um, as a matter of fact, the title of the book is Negro Education in Alabama, A Study of Cotton and Steel. And so um, right here, um, Dr. Bond says that um, Dr. Reddick greatly helped him um, get his thesis finished and accepted. Um, at the University of Chicago, and I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, by the way, um, I mentioned a few moments uh, or a little earlier that Julian Bond is the son of one of the sons of, of um, Dr. Horseman Bond and Julia Bond. Uh, well, uh, Julian Bond's um, godparents were um, W.E.B. Du Bois and E. Franklin Frazier. <laughs> and so there is a photo of Julian Bond. I don't know, Penny, do you know how old he was at that time? Yes. And so holding one hand is, is Dr. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois, and holding the other hand is Dr. E. Franklin Frazier. I mean, please. So it's like the Black Kennedys. <laughs> um, Here's a letter from Dr. Reddick to um, Dr. J.D., or excuse me, J.W. Riley. And I want to draw your attention to the third paragraph um, where Dr. Reddick writes, as for employment possibility, 
I may have to take you up on that. I am going to India and Russia with Martin Luther King, and I am publishing his biography this spring, Crusader Without Violence. Um, and it's published by Harper. Maybe the state of Alabama will not want to have me after these developments. Note the date of this letter. This letter is dated um, J- um, January 6, 1959. Um, this was f- before the publication of Dr. Reddick's book. So Dr. Reddick had an inclination then that once this book was published, um, things would get become dicey uh, with his, or I should say his teaching position at Alabama State College would be tenuous. Uh, This is the letter that um, Dr. or President Harper Council Trenum sent to um, Dr. Reddick. Um, Again, it's dated June the 14th, 1960, and uh, that's just a portion of the letter. But I want to draw your attention to what we can see uh, where he says, um, that is, Dr. Trenum says, I apologize for the delay in making a... Uh, official reply to your letter of May 28th in which you submitted your resignation from the faculty of Alabama State College to be effective as of August 31st, 1960. And so Dr. Reddick had already um, tendered basically his resignation from Alabama State College, but because of the sit-in at the Montgomery County Courthouse and the acceleration of events that took place after that, the governor would not wait um, for August 31st. um, And he ordered the termination of Dr. Reddick on the 14th of June um, by sundown. And, And so... Um, this is Dr. Reddick's reply um, to Dr. Trenum. Uh, the letter is dated June 29th, 1960. Um, basically, Dr. Reddick refuted um, and, and protested his termination. Um, Dr. Reddick was terminated with, without um, due process. Um, he did not have a hearing. He was not able to face his accusers. He was never told what charges were brought against him. He was just terminated. Um, And Dr. Reddick, um, unfortunately, was not the only faculty member to um, experience um, something like that. There um, There were faculty members at Kentucky State um, College um, that lost their jobs. There was a faculty member at Florida A&M um, that also lost his job um, because of, of, of matters relative to the um, sit-ins. This is a photograph. This gentleman right here that's looking um, right here is Dr. Lawrence Dunbar Reddick, and these are some of the students that participated in the um, um, sit-in down at the Montgomery County Courthouse. One of those students is St. John um, 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 Dixon. Um, St. John Dixon is the namesake for, or I should say, for the lead plaintiff in the St. John Dixon versus the um, Alabama State Board of Education. That case was first heard before J- Judge Frank M. Johnson. Um, six of the students, or well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So. As a result of this February 25th, 1960 sit-in demonstration, um, nine students were expelled from Alabama State College. 20 students were placed on probation. Um, St. John Dixon was one of the nine students um, that was expelled. There are only three of these students that are still alive. Uh, St. John Dixon, Mr. Joseph Peterson, and Mr. James McFadden. St. John Peterson is, I mean, excuse me, um, St. John Dixon is the um, lead plaintiff in the St. John Dixon versus Alabama State 
uh, Board of Education case. As I said, this case was first heard before uh, Judge Frank M. Johnson, someone who is, had a reputation of being sympathetic and empathetic um, to um, civil rights um, struggles. Johnson ruled in favor of the state and ruled against the um, students. Only six of the students were plaintiffs in this lawsuit. Attorney Fred Gray was the lead attorney uh, for this lawsuit. He was his co-counsel. <laughs> his co-counsel was Thurgood Marshall, Robert Carter, um, and um, I'm having a senior moment. Um, it'll come to me. But anyway, Thurgood Marshall and Robert Carter were two of his three um, um, co-counsels. And I've said to Attorney Gray, I said, you never talk about what it was like to argue a case with Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> so um, uh, this case was then appealed um, to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals overturned um, Judge Johnson's um, ruling. Um, and so the students or the state was ordered to readmit the six students who were plaintiffs. There were six students that were plaintiffs instead of nine students because three of the students did not want to, re, uh, to return to Alabama State College. Um, this, it, this case, this St. John Dixon case, is now considered a landmark decision. Um, and again, the circumstances of that case all took place right here in Montgomery, Alabama and on the campus of Alabama State um, um, College. St. John Dixon sought um, admission to San Jose State College um, in California and was denied. Um, and he was denied because he had been dishonorably expelled um, from Alabama State College. Well, unbeknownst to um, St. John Dixon, there were a handful of college presidents in California that had a secret meeting. And they decided at that secret meeting that they would not admit any sit-in demonstrators uh, or agitators to their schools. Um, and as I said, this was a secret meeting. Uh, well, uh, Governor Brown, not Jerry, but his dad, um, um, intervene, and there was a state investigation. And so subsequently, St. John Dixon was admitted to St. Jose um, State College. Um, these students were pretty much just tossed to the winds, um, and they were all over the place. And so uh, we do know what happened to several of them, but we're still working to find out what happened to all nine of the students once they had been um, expelled. And I'm also um, happy to stand here and, and report that um, um, almost a year ago, it, was, it would be a year ago next month, um, the Alabama State Board of Education um, under Dr. Ed Richardson um, expunged the records of the nine students that were expelled, uh, the 20 students that were placed on probation, and um, the faculty members who were forced to leave the university, including Dr. Reddick, who was terminated. He was the only one that was terminated. But um, Joanne Robinson, who was the president of the Women's Political Council, was forced to leave the university. Uh, Mary Fair Burks, who was the founder of the Women's Political Council, was forced to, use, uh, to leave the university. And, and Robert Williams, um, who is a dear friend of Do the King's, as well as a classmate of Dr. King at Morehouse College, um, was also uh, forced um, to leave the university. Here is a press release that was um, issued by Governor um, John Patterson's office. Um, and you can see the date on that press release, but what you cannot see oops this 
is like, you know, when students come to my office and they ask, do you have my paper? <laughs> and I have to look through like, reams and reams of paper to, to find it. Um, okay, so what you don't see, um, oh, I went to the next one. Okay, let me go back. Okay, so... What you don't see is the paragraph right below this where um, the press release says, quote, it pains me to see state money paid to teachers in Alabama schools teaching our students to disobey our laws and customs. The, and uh, we must have teachers who are loyal to the state and to the taxpayers. This was in Governor Patterson's press release. And so the four uh, faculty members that I mentioned um, that were forced to leave the university were forced to leave the university because um, the state alleged they were disloyal um, to the state of Alabama, um, disloyal to the laws of Alabama. Um, and, you know, paying no um, or completely disregarding the fact that uh, the segregation laws of the state of Alabama violated the federal laws of the United States of America um, and that the federal laws of the United States of America trumped um, the state laws of, of Alabama. But, I mean, I'm not going to stand here and argue that because, you know, Governor Patterson is an attorney, um, knew that when he wrote this press release, um, but that's, that's what the press release said. This is a letter um, from um, President Harper Council Trenum to Mr. James McFadden. This was the letter that he received when he was expelled um, from um, Alabama State College. I came across this letter last summer um, in New York at the Schomburg Center when I was working in the papers of Dr. L.D. Reddick, and I became so excited. I took a photo of it and sent it to, um, texted it, that photo to uh, Mr. McFadden, who's befriended me, and he told me that he had not seen this document in almost 60 years. But I'm struck by the tone of the document. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that um, Dr. Trenum does not say, dear Mr. McFadden, he says, dear sir. Um, and, and so I'm struck by other things in this um, letter that just strikes me as like having a tin ear. Um, but then, you know, those were complicated times and trying to read people's um, um, impulses or intentions are, are, are sort of, it's, it's, it's really tricky. Um, but this is uh, the letter that, um, that Mr. McFadden uh, received. <laughs> I like this letter. Um, this letter was um, um, sent to Dr. Reddick by his nephew, um, Harold Reddick Jr. Uh, well, I just learned not too long ago that Harold Reddick was the youngest brother of um, uh, Dr. Reddick, actually the youngest sibling in the Reddick family. He died not very long ago. He was a Pullman porter. Um, not this person, this is the son, um, the dad. Excuse me. And he was a very good friend of, of E.D. Nixon. Um, and came to Montgomery um, to participate in a tribute to um, um, Dr. Nixon. But I want to draw your attention to um, the, this letter where it says, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we are well and hope you and Aunt Ruth are the same. We regret that you had a terrible misfortune um, and we all hope that you get one of your likes. 
what was your reply to that stupid governor? <laughs> and I don't know how old um, Harold was at this time, but I love the fact that this young boy was audacious enough to say, what was your reply to that stupid governor? This is a letter to Dr. Reddick from um, Mary Fair Burks. Um, there's a part of this. There's a part of this story that that really brings me joy. There's also a part of this story that really makes me sad. This is one of them. Um, the date of this letter is October 23rd, 1960. You can see that at this time, um, Mary Fair Burks was living in Prince Anne, Maryland. The reason why um, she um, that was her resident is that she took a job at the University of Maryland um, Eastern Shore, uh, which is a historically black school um, in the Maryland system. This was not long after um, she had left Montgomery. And she, you can see where she says, just a note to say that uh, I have improved and plan to get back to work early next week. Um, I came from the hospital, suffered horribly two weeks, and had to go back. I, I, I'm showing you this letter because I want to suggest to you that the trauma that, um, that Mrs. Fairbergs and Mrs. Joanne Robinson and Dr. Reddick uh, went through, took a toll on their health. Um, and um, I think this letter suggests that. This is um, the actual plaque uh, that was given to um, Mrs. Fairbergs by the Montgomery Improvement Association in absentia. Uh, and I said in absentia because when Mrs. Uh, Fairbergs and Joanne Robinson were forced to leave Alabama State College, um, they could not return to the campus. And so if you notice that it's signed by Ralph D. Abernathy, uh, a graduate of Alabama State College, as well as the pastor of First Baptist Church, um, and the uh, president of the Montgomery Improvement Association. Um, and this, uh, these plaques were given in absentia to Mrs. Fairbergs, um, Joanne Robinson, uh, Robert Williams and um, L.D. Reddick. Here's another plaque that was given to uh, Mary Fair Burks by Alabama State College. Please note the year, 1958. So she was the best, she received a Best Teachers Award in 1958 and 1960. She was kicked out the door. I also want to read to you a letter that um, Mary Fairbanks wrote to Dr. King. Um, the date of the letter is March 31st, 1960. Um, it reads, Dear Martin, I take the liberty, or I take this liberty as this is how my letter was signed and since you are no longer my beloved pastor. I keep up with you and Coretta and the children through Juanita and Ralph. That would be Juanita and Ralph Abernathy. Everything seems fine except Coretta does not see you too much uh, because of your travels or your traveling. I'm sure you know how things are down here. Joanne Reddick and I expect to be fired. We are surprised that it hasn't happened already. I believe we will be eased out quietly in May, or at least by September. You recall that letter was dated October 1960. Uh, we would prefer being fired outright, of course. This is Dr. King's reply to Mary Fairbanks. It is dated April the 5th, 1960. Dear Frankie, 
Thank you for calling me Martin in your recent letter. It is always good to break the chain of formality. Now I can call you Frankie without any sense of guilt. Although I have been separated from you and my other friends by many miles, I have been with you every minute in concern and in genuine sympathy. I know what you are going through and be assured that you have been in my prayers. I fear that you are right in saying that President Trenum will ease 11 teachers out quietly at the end of the semester rather than um, facing it um, head on um, at this moment. The unfortunate aspect to this approach is that if you are not fired outright at this time, it will, it will lose the drama and it will be much more difficult uh, for the individuals involved to find work. I had hoped that Dr. Trenum uh, would emerge from this um, total situation as a national hero. If he would only stand up to the governor and to the Board of Education and say that he cannot in all good conscience fire the 11 faculty members who have uh, committed no crime or act of sedition. He would gain the support over um, the nation that would never, or that he would never dream of. Um, and indeed, jobs would be offered um, to him overnight if he were fired. But apparently, he doesn't see this um, and the real and and realism um, impels or impels, excuse me, us to admit that probably uh, will not um, travel or he will not travel this road. And again, this was um, Dr. King's uh, reply to um, uh, Mrs. Uh, Fair Burks. Um, and so I'm going to stop here because I want to allow time for questions if people have questions. Thank you very much. We do have some time for questions, um, so I'm going to pass around the microphone, so if you just raise your hand, I can bring it to you. Right, and so he left uh, Montgomery and moved to Coppin State, uh, Coppin State um, in Maryland, in Baltimore. Um, he left there and went to um, Temple. Um, actually, he was hired at Temple to start the African American Studies program um, and left Temple and did um, a couple of years at Harvard as a lecturer um, and then returned to um, 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 New Orleans where he retired. Was he from New Orleans? No, he grew up, um, he was born and grew up in Jacksonville. Uh, Florida. Um, oh, oh, yeah, quickly. Oh, I, I missed the point of the part where um, the part where um, the students, what were they expelled for? What was St. John expelled for? Um, okay, so the letter that the nice, ooh, the letter that the nice students um, received. Um, in Part C, it says that for conduct pres pres prejudicial um, to the school and for conduct unbecoming of a student or a future teacher in Alabama. Yeah, Yes, ma'am, it was reprinted last spring, and there are copies outside the door. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moe, for sharing uh, your work. Um, and that was basically my question, too, as well, uh, with regards to Dr. Reddick's um, uh, journey to New Orleans and uh, his connection with Dillard University. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Pre-Hurricane Katrina, I had kind of came across a little bit about Dr. Reddick at Dillard, and mm -hmm. so uh, if you could 
just uh, make it just a small piece. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, all of this that happened in Alabama affected you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Reddick was like one of the first um, uh, PhDs to be hired by Dillard. Um, uh, uh, his uh, wife was the daughter of a very prominent African American surgeon um, in um, in New Orleans. Uh, his name was um, John Willard Thomas. Uh, John Willard Thomas graduated from Harvard College um, in 1895. He graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1900 and practiced in New Orleans as a surgeon for more than 50 years. Um, yeah, um, so, uh, you know, Dr. Reddick was one of the um, WPA um, um, writers or researchers. Um, he worked on the, the piece for the slave narratives, uh, the, the, that is the interviews. Um, he was really in the vanguard of a lot of things. I mean, he um, was one of the proponents for Negro History Week, which subsequently became Negro History Month. Um, uh, yeah, he, um, he and, and, and Lorenzo Green and, um, and others um, started microfilming um, um, important African American um, documents um, as early as the, the late 1930s, early 1940s, because they they understood the importance of preserving these 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 documents, especially um, black newspapers or then Negro newspapers. Dr. Moten, thank you for that stimulating presentation. I wanted to ask you a question, and this is probably is going to come from conjecture, but uh, you spoke about how Joanne Robinson and Mary Fairbanks and others had a toll on their health. But I've also heard rumors that there was also a great toll on um, uh, Dr. Trenum, because he was caught, in my opinion, between a rock and a hard place. Oh, thank you so much for mentioning that, because this is what I really wanted to end with. <sighs> Dr. Trenum in 61 was terminated by the Alabama State Board of Education for his illness, quote unquote. Shortly after that, the Alabama, no, excuse me, the Southern Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools dropped Alabama State College from its accredited list of schools. And so Alabama State College lost its accreditation. That's in 61. In 62, President Joseph F. Drake, the president of Alabama A&M University, was terminated by the Alabama State Board of Education for his health. In 1962, the Southern Association for Colleges and Secondary Schools dropped A&M from its list of accredited schools. And so that by 1962, the two public black supported uh, um, schools in Alabama, both were um, uncredited. I mean, they, they, they didn't have their accreditation because of the Southern Association. Now, I have a letter from um, Horseman Bond to the president of Birmingham um, Southern University, um, Dr. Stanford, who happened to have been uh, in 1960 the president of Sachs. And Dr. Bond asked Dr. Stanford directly, will these student protests put in jeopardy these schools insofar as Sachs is concerned? We have, I have not been able to find the letter with Dr. Stanford's answer to Dr. Bond. I don't know if he did answer his letter. But Dr. Bond was the person who, who 
clued me or who told or who suggested to me that there may be something there. And so what I'm now trying to figure out, because newspapers at the time wrote that the student protests not only were responsible for the removal of Dr. or President Trenum and President um, Drake, but was also the re, uh, responsible for both of these schools losing their accreditation. I don't know if the governor had anything to do with that, but I strongly suspect he may have. We have time for one more question. Will you please explain more about the title, Change Without Violence? Change Without Violence? Crusader Without Violence. Oh. Um, you know, I'm still trying to, fig or to figure out or find out um, how Dr. Reddick came up with that title. I do know that um, at one point there was a voter drive that um, SCLC used in the South that used the name um, Crusader or the word Crusader. And so I don't know if, if but that would have been after the publication of the book. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't know, because Dr. Reddick, in, you know, in, in, insofar as the papers that he's left, um, he doesn't explain um, the title. I don't believe that the title was given um, to Dr. Reddick, excuse me, by the publisher. Um, but I, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, can you please join me in giving Dr. Moten another big thank you.